Section Zero of the Golden Spheres and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Spheres and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy. Preface It comes to me as a very welcome piece of news and yet a piece of news which I have been long expecting, that a special American edition of Edmund Leamy's Irish fairy tales is about to be published. This, then, will be the third issue of the little book. I venture to predict that it will not be the last, and I fancy the American publisher, who has had the judgment to take the matter up, will soon be rewarded for his enterprise. For I believe the book to be a little classic in its way, and that it will go on making for itself a place in the libraries of those who understand children, and will hold that place permanently. This is the verdict of competent literary judges. I am spared the necessity of attempting a discussion of the grounds on which so strong an opinion of Leamy's fairy tales is based by the fact that this is already done in Mr. T. P. Gill's introductory note. Mr. Gill, though he was, like myself, one of Leamy's intimate friends, is a conscientious critic, and to his analysis not merely of the tales, but of that attractive personality which Leamy infused into all he said or wrote, I can safely refer the reader. I think no one of taste and judgment who reads these tales will fail to agree with the view which is expressed in that note, and which I hear with some confidence venture to reiterate. My chief hope with regard to this American edition is that when it has made its mark with the general public, as it is sure to do, it will be taken note of by those who are specially concerned with education. Leamy, while a public man, a patriot steeped in the lore of Ireland's past and ever weaving generous visions for her future, was before all things else a child lover. That was his own, his peculiar endowment. He had an exquisite gift with children and seemed always able to speak directly with the higher parts of their nature. It is this, I think, which is evident in every page of these tales, and which gives the book its unique character, one to whose judgment on an educational matter I attach the greatest value writes to me these words, for refining influence, for power to stimulate the sense of beauty, the tenderness, the sentiment of nobleness of the child's soul. I can imagine no volume more worthy of a place on the bookshelf of the people's schools. Having myself often witnessed this influence at work, I can emphatically endorse this opinion. I say I hope American educators may agree with it, for if they do, our educators here at home will follow so distinguished a lead. Of Edmund Leamy in his personal aspect, I have already said something in my preface to the Dublin edition. I need only add here that this true-hearted Irishman had many friends on the American continent, and that to them this little flower of his genius will be a vivid and abiding souvenir of one of the most lovable of men. If this book had the success in America which it deserves, and I hope that success may be extended to Canada and Australia's, I believe a charming and ennobling boon will have been conferred upon the child life of these great communities, and it will be a source of gratification to those who were the author's friends and colleagues to think that that gift came from one by whose side we had the honour to serve in Ireland's struggles. J. E. Redmond I. Kavanagh, June 1911 End of Section Zero Section 1 of The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy. The Golden Spears. Once upon a time, there lived in a little house under a hill a little old woman and her two children, whose names were Conla and Nora. 
Right in front of the door of the little house lay a pleasant meadow, and beyond the meadow rose up to the skies a mountain, whose top was sharp-pointed like a spear. For more than halfway up it was clad with heather, and when the heather was in bloom it looked like a purple robe falling from the shoulders of the mountain down to its feet. Above the heather it was bare and grey, but when the sun was sinking in the sea, its last rays rested on the bare mountain top and made it gleam like a spear of gold, so the children always called it the golden spear. In summer days they gambled in the meadow, plucking the sweet wild grasses, and often and often they clambered up the mountainside, knee-deep in the heather, searching for fretchens and wild honey, and sometimes they found a bird's nest. But they only peeped into it, they never touched the eggs or allowed their breath to fall upon them, for next to their little mother they loved the mountain, and next to the mountain they loved the wild birds who made the spring and summer weather musical with their songs. Sometimes the soft white mist would steal through the glen, and creeping up the mountain would cover it with a veil so dense that the children could not see it, and then they would say to each other, Our mountain has gone away from us. But when the mist would lift and float off into the skies, the children would clap their hands and say, Oh, there's our mountain back again. In the long nights of winter they babbled of the spring and summer time to come, when the birds would once more sing for them, and never a day passed that they didn't fling crumbs outside their door, and on the borders of the wood that stretched away towards the glen. When the spring days came, they awoke with the first light of the morning, and they knew the very minute when the lark would begin to sing, and when the thrush and the blackbird would pour out their liquid notes, and when the robin would make the soft, green, tender leaves tremulous at his song. It chanced one day that when they were resting in the noontide heat, under the perfumed shade of a hawthorn in bloom, they saw on the edge of the meadow, spread out before them, a speckled thrush cowering in the grass. Oh, Conla, Conla, look at the thrush, and look, look up in the sky, there is a hawk, cried Nora. Conla looked up, and he saw the hawk with quivering wings, and he knew that in a second it would pounce down on the frightened thrush. He jumped to his feet, fixed the stone in his sling, and before the whir of the stone shooting through the air was silent, the stricken hawk tumbled headlong in the grass. The thrush shaking its wings, rose joyously in the air, and perching upon an elm tree in sight of the children, he sang a song so sweet that they left the hawthorn shade and walked along together, until they stood under the branches of the elm. And they listened and listened to the thrush's song, and at last Nora said, Oh, Conla, did you ever hear a song so sweet as this? No, said Conla, and I do believe sweeter music was never heard before. Ah, said the thrush, that's because you never heard the nine little pipers playing. And now, Conla and Nora, you saved my life today. It was Nora saved it, said Conla, for she pointed you out to me, and also pointed out the hawk which was about to pounce on you. It was Conla saved you, said Nora, for he slew the hawk with his sling. I owe my life to both of you, said the thrush. You like my song, and you say you have never heard anything so sweet. But wait till you hear the nine little pipers playing. And when shall we hear them? said the children. Well, said the thrush, sit outside your door tomorrow evening, and wait and watch until the shadows have crept up the heather. And then, when the mountain top is gleaming like a golden spear, look at the line where the shadow on the heather meets the sunshine, and you shall see what you shall see. And having said this, the thrush sang another song sweeter than the first, and then saying good-bye, he flew away into the woods. The children went home, and all night long they were dreaming of the thrush and the nine little pipers, and when the birds sang in the morning, they got up and went out into the meadow to watch the mountain. The sun was shining in a cloudless sky, and no shadows lay on the mountain. And all day long they watched and waited, and at last, when the birds were singing their farewell song to the evening star, the children saw the shadows marching from the glen, trooping up the mountainside, and dimming the purple of the heather. 
and when the mountain top gleamed like a golden spear, they fixed their eyes on the line between the shadow and the sunshine. Now, said Connla, the time has come. Oh, look, look, said Nora, and as she spoke, just above the line of shadow, a door opened out, and through its portals came a little piper, dressed in green and gold. He stepped down, followed by another and another, until there were nine in all, and then the door slung back again. Down through the heather marched the pipers in single file, and all the time they played a music so sweet that the birds, who had gone to sleep in their nests, came out upon the branches to listen to them. And then they crossed the meadow, and they went on and on until they disappeared in the leafy woods. While they were passing, the children were spellbound and couldn't speak, but when the music had died away in the woods, they said, The thrush is right. That is the sweetest music that was ever heard in all the world. And when the children went to bed that night, the fairy music came to them in their dreams. But when the morning broke, and they looked out upon the mountain and could see no trace of the door above the header, they asked each other whether they had really seen the little pipers, or only dreamt of them. That day they went out into the woods, and they sat beside a stream that pattered along beneath the trees, and though the leaves tossing in the breeze, the sun flashed down upon the streamlet, and shadow and sunshine danced upon it. As the children watched the water sparkling when the sunlight fell, Nora said, Oh, Conla, did you ever see anything so bright and clear and glancing as that? No, said Conla, I never did. That's because you never saw the crystal hall of the fairy of the mountains, said a voice above the heads of the children. And when they looked up, who should they see, perched on a branch, but the thrush? And where is the crystal hall of the fairy? said Conla. Oh, it is where it always was, and where it always will be, said the thrush. And you can see it if you like. We would like to see it, said the children. Well then, said the thrush, if you would, all you have to do is to follow the nine little pipers when they come down through the heather, and cross the meadow tomorrow evening. And the thrush, having said this, flew away. Connla and Nora went home, and that night they fell asleep talking of the thrush and the fairy and the crystal hall. All the next day they counted the minutes, until they saw the shadows thronging from the glen and scaling the mountainside. And at last they saw the doors bringing open, and the nine little pipers marching down. They waited until the pipers had crossed the meadow, and were about to enter the wood. And then they followed them, the pipers marching on before them, and playing all the time. It was not long until they had passed through the wood, and then what should the children see rising up before them but another mountain, smaller than their own, but, like their own, clad more than halfway up with purple heather, and whose top was bare and sharp-pointed, and gleaming like a golden spear. Up through the heather climbed the pipers, up through the heather the children clambered after them, and the moment the pipers passed the heather, a door opened and they marched in, the children following, and the door closed behind them. Connla and Nora were so dazzled by the light that hit their eyes, when they had crossed the threshold that they had to shade them with their hands, but after a moment or two they became able to bear the splendour, and when they looked around they saw that they were in a noble hall, whose crystal roof was supported by two rows of crystal pillars rising from a crystal floor, and the walls were of crystal, and along the walls were crystal couches, with coverings and cushions of sapphire silk with silver tassels. Over the crystal floor the little pipers marched, over the crystal floor the children followed, and when a door at the end of the hall was opened to let the pipers pass, a crowd of colours came rushing in, and floor and ceiling and stately pillars and glancing couches and shining walls were stained with a thousand dazzling hues. Out through the door the pipers marched, out through the door the children followed, and when they crossed the threshold they were treading on clouds of amber, of purple, and of gold. "'Oh, Conla," said Nora, "'we have walked into the sunset!' And around and about them everywhere were soft, fleecy clouds, and over their heads 
was the glowing sky and the stars were shining through it as a lady's eye shone through a veil of gossamer and the sky and stars seemed so near that Kalna thought he could almost touch them with his hand when they had gone some distance the pipers disappeared and when Connla and Nora came up to the spot where they had seen the last of them, they found themselves at the head of a ladder, all the steps of which were formed of purple and amber clouds that descended to what appeared to be a vast and shining plain, streaked with purple and gold. In the spaces between the streaks of gold and purple they saw soft, milk-white stars, and the children thought that the great plain so far below them also belonged to Cloudland. They could not see the little pipers, but up the steps was borne by the cool, sweet air the fairy music, and lured on by it step by step they travelled down the fleecy stairway. When they were little more than halfway down, there came mingled with the music a sound almost as sweet, the sound of waters toying in the still air with pebbles on a shelving beach, and with the sound came the odorous brine of the ocean. And then the children knew that what they thought was a plain in the realms of Cloudland was the sleeping sea, unstirred by wind or tide, dreaming of the purple clouds and stars of the sunset sky above it. When Conla and Nora reached the strand, they saw the nine little pipers marching out towards the sea, and they wondered where they were going to. And they could hardly believe their eyes when they saw them stepping out upon the level ocean, as if they were walking upon the land and the way the nine little pipers marched, treading the golden line cast upon the waters by the setting sun. And as the music became fainter and fainter, as the pipers passed into the glowing distance, the children began to wonder what was to become of themselves. Just at that very moment they saw coming towards them from the sinking sun a little white horse, with flowing mane and tail and golden hoofs. On the horse's back was a little man dressed in shining green silk. When the horse galloped on to the strand, the little man doffed his hat and said to the children, Would you like to follow the nine little pipers? The children said, Yes. Well then, said the little man, come up here behind me. You, Nora, first, and Conla after. Conla helped up Nora, and then climbed on to the little steed himself and as soon as they were properly seated the little man said swish and away went the steed galloping over the sea without wetting hair or hoof but fast as he galloped the nine little pipers were always ahead of him although they seemed to be going only at a walking pace when at last he came up rather close to the hindmost of them the nine little pipers disappeared but the children heard the music playing beneath the waters the white steed pulled up suddenly, and wouldn't move a step further. Now, said the little man to the children, clasp me tight, Nora, and do you, Conla, cling on to Nora, and both of you shut your eyes. The children did as they were bidden, and the little man cried, swish, swash, and the steed went down and down until at last his feet struck the bottom. Now open your eyes, said the little man. And when the children did so, they saw beneath the horse's feet a golden strand, and above their heads the sea like a transparent cloud between them and the sky. And once more they heard the fairy music, and marching on the strand before them were the nine little pipers. You must get off now, said the little man. I can go no farther with you. The children scrambled down, and the little man cried, Swish! And himself and the steed shot up through the sea and they saw him no more. Then they set out after the nine little pipers, and it wasn't long until they saw rising up from the golden strand, and pushing their heads up into the sea above, a mass of dark grey rocks. And as they were gazing at them, they saw the rocks opening, and the nine little pipers disappearing through them. The children hurried on, and when they came up close to the rocks, they saw sitting on a flat and polished stone a mermaid combing her golden hair, and singing a strange sweet song that brought the tears to their eyes, and by the mermaid's side was a little sleek brown otter. When the mermaid saw them, she flung her golden tresses back over her snow-white shoulders, and she beckoned the children to her. Her large eyes were full of sadness, 
but there was a look so tender upon her face that the children moved towards her without any fear come to me little one she said to nora come and kiss me and in a second her arms were around the child the mermaid kissed her again and again as the tears rushed to her eyes she said oh nora Marronine, your breath is as sweet as the wild rose that blooms in the green fields of erin and happy are you my children who have come so lately from the pleasant land o oh, conla conla i get the scent of the dew of the irish grasses and of the purple heather from your feet and you both can soon return to erin at the streams but i shall not see it till three hundred years have passed away for i am liban the mermaid daughter of a line of kings but i may not keep you here the fairy queen is waiting for you in her snow-white palace and her fragrant bowers now kiss me once more nora and kiss me conla may luck and joy go with you and all gentleness be upon you both then the children said good-bye to the mermaid and the rocks opened for them and they passed through and soon they found themselves in the meadow start with flowers and through the meadow sped a sunlit stream they followed the stream until it led them into a garden of roses and beyond the garden standing on a gentle hill was a palace white as snow before the palace was a crowd of fairy maidens pelting each other with rose leaves but when they saw the children they gave over their play and came trooping towards them our queen is waiting for you they said and then they led the children to the palace door the children entered and after passing through a long corridor they found themselves in a crystal hall so like the one they had seen in the mountain of the golden spear that they thought it was the same but on all the crystal couches fairies dressed in silken robes of many colours were sitting and at the end of the hall on a crystal throne seated the fairy queen looking lovelier than the evening star the queen descended from her throne to meet the children and taking them by the hands she led them up the shining steps then sitting down she made them sit beside her conla on her right hand and nora on her left then she ordered the nine little pipers to come before her and she said to them so far you have done your duty faithfully and now play one more sweet air and your task is done and the little pipers played and from the couches of the first sound of the music all the fairies rose and forming partners they danced over the crystal floor as lightly as the young leaves dancing in the wind listening to the fairy music and watching the wavy motion of the dancing fairies the children fell asleep when they awoke next morning and rose from their silken beds they were no longer children nora was a graceful and stately maiden and conla a handsome and gallant youth they looked at each other for a moment in surprise and then conla said oh nora how tall and beautiful you are oh not so tall and handsome as you are conla said nora as she flung her white arms round his neck and kissed her brother's lips then they drew back to get a better look of each other and who should step between them but the fairy queen oh nora nora said she i am not as high as your knee and as for you conla you look as straight and as tall as one of the round towers of erin and how did we grow so tall in one night said conla in one night said the fairy queen one night indeed why you have been fast asleep the two of you for the last seven years and where was the little mother all that time said conla and nora together oh the little mother was all right she knew where you were but she is expecting you to-day and so you must go off to see her although i would like to keep you if i had my way all to myself here in the fairyland under the sea and you will see her to-day but before you go here is a necklace for you nora it is formed out of the drops of the ocean spray sparkling in the sunshine they were caught by my fairy nymphs for you as they skimmed the sunlit billows under the shape of sea-birds and no queen or princess in the world can match their lustre with the diamonds one would toil from the caves of the earth as for you conla see here is a helmet of shining gold fit for a king of erin and a king of erin you will be yet and here's a spear 
that will pierce any shield and here's a shield that no spear can pierce and no sword can cleave as long as you fasten your warrior cloak with this brooch of gold and as she spoke she flung round conla's shoulders a flowing mantle of yellow silk and pinned it at his neck with a red gold brooch and now my children you must go away from me you nora will be a warrior's bride in erin of the streams and you conla will be king yet over the loveliest province in all the land of erin but you will have to fight for your crown and days of battle are before you they will not come for a long time after you have left the fairyland under the sea and until they come lay aside your helmet shield and spear and warrior's cloak and golden brooch but when the time comes when you will be called to battle enter not upon it without the golden brooch i give you fastened in your cloak for if you do harm will come to you now kiss me children your little mother is waiting for you at the foot of the golden spear but do not forget to say good-bye to Liban the mermaid exiled from the land she loves and pining in sadness beneath the sea Conla and Nora kissed the fairy queen, and Conla, wearing his golden helmet and silken cloak, and carrying his shield and spear, led Nora with him. They passed from the palace through the garden of roses, through the flowery meadow, through the dark grey rocks, until they reached the golden strand, and there, sitting and singing the strange sweet song, was Liban the mermaid. And so you are going up to Erin, she said, up through the covering waters kiss me children once again and when you are an errand of the streams sometimes think of the exile from Erin beneath the sea and the children kissed the mermaid and with sad hearts bidding her good-bye they walked along the golden strand when they had gone what seemed to them a long way they began to feel weary and just then they saw coming towards them a little man in a red jacket leading a coal-black steed when they met the little man he said conla put nora upon his steed then jump up before her conla did as he was told and when both of them were mounted now conla said the little man catch the bridle in your hands and you nora clasp conla round your waist and close your eyes they did as they were bidden and then the little man said swash swish and the steed shot up from the strand like a lark from the grass and pierced the covering sea and went bounding on over the level waters and when his hoofs struck the hard ground conla and nora opened their eyes and they saw that they were galloping towards a shady wood on went the steed and soon he was galloping beneath the branches that almost touched conla's head and on they went until they had passed through the wood and then they saw rising up before them the golden spear oh conla said nora we are at home at last yes said conla but where is the little house under the hill and no little house was there but in its stead was standing a lime-white mansion what can this mean said nora but before conla could reply the steed had galloped up to the door of the mansion and in the twinkling of an eye conla and nora were standing on the ground outside the door and the steed had vanished before they could recover from their surprise the little mother came rushing out to them and flung her arms around their necks and kissed them both again and again oh children children you are welcome home to me for though i knew it was all for the best my heart was lonely without you and conla and nora caught up the little mother in their arms and they carried her into the hall and set her down on the floor oh nora said the little mother you are a head over me and as for you conla you look almost as tall as one of the round towers of erin that's what the fairy queen said mother said nora blessings on the fairy queen says the little mother turn around conla till i look at you conla turned round and the little mother said oh conla with your golden helmet and your spear and your glancing shield and your silken cloak you look like a king but take them off my boy beautiful as they are your little mother would like to see you her own brave boy without any fairy finery and conla laid aside his spear and shield and took off his golden helmet and his silken cloak 
then he caught the little mother and kissed her and lifted her up until she was as high as his head and said he don't you know little mother i'd rather have you than all the world and that night when they were sitting down by the fire together you may be sure that in the whole world no people were half as happy as Nora, Kanla, and the Little Mother. End of section one. Recording by phone. Section two of the Golden Spares and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy The House in the Lake A long, long time ago there lived in a little hut in the midst of one of the inland lakes of Erin, an old fisherman and his son. The hut was built on stakes driven into the bed of the lake, and was so high above the waters that even when they were stirred into waves by the wind coming down from the mountains, they did not reach the threshold of the door. Around, outside the hut, on a level with the floor, was a little wicker-work platform, and under the platform, close to the steps leading up to it from the water, the fisherman's cura, made of willows, covered with skins, was moored, and it was only by means of the cura that he and his son, Enda, could leave their lake dwelling. On many a summer evening, Enda lay stretched on the platform, watching the sunset fading from the mountain tops, and the twilight creeping over the waters of the lake and it chanced that once when he was so engaged he heard a rustle in a clump of sedge that grew close to one side of the hut he turned to where the sound came from and what should he see but an otter swimming towards him with a little trout in his mouth when the otter came up to where enda was lying he lifted his head and half his body from the water and flung the trout on the platform almost at enda's feet and then disappeared Enda took the little panting trout in his hand, but as he did so he heard, quite close to him, in the lake, a sound like that of water plashing upon water, and he saw the widening circles caused by a trout which had just risen to a fly, and he said to the little trout he held in his hand, "'I won't keep you, poor thing. Perhaps that was a little comrade come to look for you, and so I'll send you back to him.' And saying this, he dropped the little trout into the lake." Well, when the next evening came, again Enda was lying stretched outside the hut, and once more he heard the rustle in the sedge, and once more the otter came and flung the little trout almost into his hands. Enda, more surprised than ever, did not know what to do. He saw that it was the same little trout the otter had brought in the night before, and he said, Well, I gave you a chance last night. I'll give you another, if only to see what will come of it and he dropped the trout into the lake, but no sooner had it touched the waters than it was changed into a beautiful milk-white swan, and Enda could hardly believe his eyes, as he saw it sailing across the lake, until it was lost in the sedges growing by the shore. All that night he lay awake, thinking of what he had seen, and as soon as the morning stood on the hilltops, and cast its shafts of golden light across the lake, Enda rose and got into his curragh. He rode all round the shores, beating the sedges with his oar, in pursuit of the swan, but all in vain, he could not catch a glimpse of her white plumage anywhere. Day after day he rode about the lake in search of her, and every evening he lay outside the hut watching the waters. At long last, one night, when the full moon, rising above the mountains, flooded the whole lake with light, he saw the swan coming swiftly towards him, shining brighter than the moonbeams. The swan came on until it was almost within the boat's length of the hut, and what should Enda hear but the swan speaking to him in his own language? "'Get into your cura, Enda, and follow me,' said she, and, saying this, she turned round and sailed away. Enda jumped into the cura, and soon the water, dripping from his oar, was flashing like diamonds in the moonlight. And he rode after the swan, who glided on before him until she came to where the shadows of the mountains lay deepest on the lake. Then the swan rested, and when Enda came up to her, Enda, said she, I have brought you where none may hear what I wish to say to you. 
i am maeve the daughter of the king of erin by the magic arts of my cruel stepmother i was changed into a trout and cast into this lake a year and a day before the evening when you restored me to the waters the second time if you had not done so the first night the altar brought me to you i should have been changed into a hooting owl if you had not done so the second night i should have been changed into a croaking raven but thanks to you enda i am now a snow-white swan and for one hour on the first night of every full moon the power of speech is and will be given to me as long as i remain a swan and a swan i must always remain unless you are willing to break the spell of enchantment that is over me and you alone can break it i'll do anything i can for you o oh princess said enda but how can i break the spell you can do so said the swan only by pouring upon my plumage the perfumed water that fills the golden bowl that is in the inmost room of the palace of the fairy queen beneath the lake and how can i get that said enda well said the swan you must dive beneath the lake and walk along its bed until you come to where the lake dragon guards the entrance of the fairy queen's dominions i can dive like a fish said enda but how can i walk beneath the waters you can do it easily enough said the swan if you get the water dress of brian one of the three sons of turin and his helmet of transparent crystal by the aid of which he was able to walk under the green salt sea and where shall i find them they are in the water place of angus of de boyne said the swan but you should set out at once for if the spell be not broken before the moon is full again it cannot be broken for a year and a day i'll set out in the first ray of the morning said enda may luck and joy go with you said the swan and now the hours of silence are coming upon me and i have only time to warn you that dangers you little dream of will lie before you in your quest for the golden cup i am willing to face all dangers for your sake o princess said enda blessings be upon you enda said the swan and she sailed away from the shadow out into the light across the lake to the sedgy banks and enda saw her no more he rode his cura home and he lay on his bed without taking off his clothes and as the first faint glimmer of the morning came slanting down the mountains he stepped into his cura and pulled across the lake and took the road towards the water palace of angus of de boyne when he reached the banks of the glancing river a little woman dressed in red was standing there before him you are welcome enda said she and glad am i to see the day that brings you here to help the winsome princess maeve and now wait a second and the water dress and crystal helmet will be ready for you and having said this the little woman plucked a handful of wild grasses and she breathed upon them three times and then flung them on the river and a dozen fairy nymphs came springing up through the water bearing the water dress and crystal helmet and a shining spear and they laid them down upon the bank at enda's feet and then disappeared now enda said the fairy woman take these by the aid of the dress and the helmet you can walk beneath the waters you will need to spare to enable you to meet the dangers that lie before you but with that spear if you only have courage you can overcome everything and every one that may attempt to bar your way having said this she bid good-bye to enda and stepping off the bank she floated out upon the river as lightly as a red poppy leaf and when she came to the middle of the stream she disappeared beneath the waters enda took the helmet dress and spear and it was not long until he came to the sedgy banks where his little boat was waiting for him as he stepped into the cura the moon was rising above the mountains he rode on until he came to the hut and having moored the boat to the door he put on the water dress and the crystal helmet and taking the spear in his hand he leaped over the side of the cura and sank down and down until he touched the bottom then he walked along without minding where he was going and the only light he had was the shimmering moonlight which descended as faintly through the waters as if it came through muffled glass 
he had not gone very far when he heard a horrible hissing and straight before him he saw what he thought were two flaming coals after a few more steps he found himself face to face with the dragon of the lake the guardian of the palace of the fairy queen before he had time to raise his spear the dragon had wound its coils around him and he heard its horrible teeth crunching against the side of his crystal helmet and he felt the pressure of its coils around his side and the breath almost left his body but the dragon unable to pierce the helmet unwound his coils and soon enda's hands were free and before the dragon could attempt to seize him again he drove his spear through one of its fiery eyes and writhing with pain the hissing dragon darted through a cave behind him enda gaining courage from the dragon's flight marched on until he came to a door of dull brass set in the rocks he tried to push it in before him but he might as well have tried to push away the rocks while he was wondering what he should do he heard again the fierce hissing of the dragon and saw the red glare of his fiery eye dimly in the water lifting a spear and hastily turning round to meet the furious monster enda accidentally touched the door with the point of the spear and the door flew open enda passed through and the door closed behind him with a grating sound and he marched along through a rocky pass which led to a sandy plain as he stepped from the pass into the plain the sands began to move as if they were alive in a second a thousand hideous serpents almost the colour of the sand rose hissing up and with their forked tongues made a horrible poisonous hedge in front of him for a second he stood dismayed but then levelling his spear he rushed against the hedge of serpents and they shooting poison at him sank beneath the sand but the poison did not harm him because of its water dress and crystal helmet when he had passed over the sandy plain he had to climb a great steep jagged rock when he got to the top of the rock he saw spread out before him a stony waste without a tuft or blade of grass at some distance in front of him he noticed a large dark object which he took to be a rock but on looking at it more closely he saw that it was a huge misshapen swollen mass apparently alive and it was growing bigger and bigger every moment and this stood amazed at the sight and before he knew where he was the loathsome creature rose from the ground and sprang upon him before he could use his spear and catching him in its horrid grasp flung him back over the rocks onto the sandy plain and i was almost stunned but the hissing of the serpents rising from the sand around him brought him to himself and jumping to his feet once more he drove them down beneath the surface he then approached the jagged rock on the top of which he saw the filthy monster glaring at him with bloodshot eyes and the poised his spear and hurled it against his enemy it entered between the monster's eyes and from the wound the blood flowed down like a black torrent and dyed the plain and the shrunken carcass slipped down the front of the rocks and disappeared beneath the sand and i once more ascended the rock and without meeting or seeing anything he passed over the stony waste and at last he came to a leafy wood he had not gone far in the wood until he heard the sound of fairy music and walking on he came upon a mossy glade and there he found the fairies dancing around their queen they were so small and were all so brightly dressed that they looked like a mass of waving flowers but when he was seen by them they vanished like a glorious dream and no one remained before him but the fairy queen the queen blushed at finding herself alone but on stamping her little foot three times upon the ground the frightened fairies all crept back again you are welcome enda said the queen my little subjects have been alarmed by your strange deaths and crystal helmet i pray you take them off you do not need them here enda did as he was bidden and he laid down his water dress and helmet on the grass and the little fairies seeing him in his proper shape got over their fright and unrestrained by the presence of the queen they ran tumbling over one another to try and get a good look at the crystal helmet i know what you have come for enda said the queen 
the golden cup you shall have to-morrow but to-night you must share our feast so follow me to the palace having said this the queen beckoned her pages to her and attended by them and followed by enda she went on through the wood when they had left it behind them enda saw on the green hill before him the snow-white palace of the fairy queen as the queen approached the steps that led up to the open door a band of tiny fairies dressed in rose-coloured silk came out carrying baskets of flowers which they flung down on the steps to make a fragrant carpet for her they were followed by a band of harpers dressed in yellow silken robes who ranked themselves on each side of the steps and played their sweetest music as the queen ascended when the queen followed by enda entered the palace they passed through a crystal hall that led to a banquet room the room was lighted by a single star large as a battle shield it was fixed against the wall above a diamond throne the queen seated herself upon the throne and the pages advancing towards her and bending low as they approached the steps handed her a golden wand the queen waved the wand three times and a table laden with all kinds of delicacies appeared upon the floor then she beckoned enda to her and when he stood beside her the fairy table was no higher than his knee i am afraid i must make you smaller enda said the queen or you will never be able to seat yourself at my fairy table and having said this she touched enda with the golden wand and at once he became as small as her tallest page then she struck the steps of her throne and all the nobles of her court headed by her bards took their places at the festive board the feast went on right merrily and when the tiny jewelled drinking cups were placed upon the table the queen ordered the harpers to play and the little harper struck the chords and as enda listened to the music it seemed to him as if he was being slowly lifted from his seat and when the music ended the fairies vanished the shining star went out and enda was in perfect darkness the air blew keenly in his face and he knew not where he was at last he saw a faint grey light and as soon this light grew broader and brighter and as the shadows fled before it he could hardly believe his eyes when he found himself in a skura on the lake and the moonlight streaming down from the mountain tops for a moment he thought he must have been dreaming but there in the boat before him were the crystal helmet and the water dress and the gleaming spear and the golden bowl of perfumed water that was to remove the spell of enchantment from the white swan of the lake and sailing towards him from the sedgy bank came the snow-white swan and when she touched the boat and put out his hands and lifted her in and then over her plumage he poured the perfumed water from the golden bowl and the princess maeve in all her maiden beauty stood before him take your oar enda she said and row to the southern bank enda seized his oar and the curra sped across the waters swifter than a swallow in its flight when the boat touched the shore enda jumped out and lifted the princess on to the bank send your boat adrift enda she said but first take out your shining spear the water dress and the crystal helmet will take care of themselves enda took out the spear and then pushed the boat from the bank it sped on towards the hut in the middle of the lake but before it had reached halfway six nymphs sprang up from the water and seizing the helmet and dress sank with them beneath the tide and the boat went on until it pushed its prow against the steps of the little hut where it remained then enda and the princess turned towards the south and it was not long until they came to a deep forest that was folding up its shadows and spreading out its mossy glades before the glancing footsteps of the morning they had not gone far through the forest when they heard the music of hounds and the cries of huntsmen and crashing towards them through the low branches they saw a fierce wild boar enda gently pushing the princess behind him levelled his spear and when the boar came close to him he drove it into his throat the brute fell dead at his feet and the dogs rushing up began to tear it to pieces 
the princess fainted at the sight and while enda was endeavouring to restore her the king of erin followed by his huntsmen appeared and when the king saw the princess he started in amazement as he recognised the features of his daughter Maeve. at that moment the princess came to herself and her father lifting her tenderly in his arms kissed her again and again i have mourned you as dead my darling said he and now you are restored to me more lovely than ever i would gladly have given up my throne for this but say who is the champion who has brought you hither and who has slain the wild boar we have hunted so many years in vain the princess blushed like a rose as she said his name is enda father it is he has brought me back to you then the king embraced enda and said forgive me enda for asking any questions about you before you have shared the hospitality of my court my palace lies beyond the forest and we shall reach it soon then the king ordered his huntsmen to sound the bugle horn and all his nobles galloped up in answer to it and when they saw the princess Maeve, they were so dazzled by her beauty that they scarcely gave a thought to the death of the wild boar it is my daughter Maeve, come back to me said the king and all the nobles lowered their lances and bowed in homage to the lady and there stands the champion who has brought her home said the king pointing to enda the nobles looked at enda and bowed courteously but in their hearts they were jealous of the champion for they saw he was already a favourite of the king's then the pages came up leading milk-white steeds with golden bridles and the king ordering enda to mount one of them lifted Maeve on to his own and mounted behind her the pages carrying the boar's head on a hollow shield preceded by the huntsmen sounding their horns set out towards the palace and the royal party followed them as the procession approached the palace crowds came rushing out to see the trophies of the chase and through the snow-white door the queen Maeve's cruel stepmother attended by her maids of honour and the royal bards came forth to greet the king but when she saw seated before him the princess Maeve, who she thought was at the bottom of the lake under a spell of enchantment she uttered a loud cry and fell senseless to the ground the king jumped from his horse and rushing to the queen lifted her up and carried her in his arms to her apartment for he had no suspicion of the wickedness of which she had been guilty and the court liches were summoned to attend her but she died that very night and it was not until a green mound worthy of a queen of erin had been raised over her grave that the princess Maeve told her father of the wickedness of her stepmother and when she told him the whole story of how enda had broken the spell of enchantment and of the dangers which she had faced for her sake the king summoned an assembly for all his nobles and seated on his throne wearing his golden helmet the bards upon his right hand and the druids upon his left and the nobles in ranks before him with gleaming helmets and flashing spears he told them the story of the princess and of the service which enda had rendered to her and now said the king if the princess is willing to take her deliverer for her husband i am willing that she shall be his bride and if you my subjects bards and druids and nobles and chiefs of erin have anything to say against this union speak but first Maeve, said the king as he drew the blushing princess to him speak darling as becomes the daughter of a king speak in the presence of the nobles of erin and say if it is your wish to become enda's bride the princess flung her white arms around her father's neck as she murmured father it was enda brought me back to you and before all the princes and nobles of erin i am willing to be his bride and she buried her head upon the king's breast and as he stroked her silken hair falling to her feet the bards struck their golden harps but the sound of the joyous music could hardly drown the murmurs of the jealous nobles when the music ceased the king beckoned enda to him and was about to place his hand in maeve's when a druid whose white beard almost touched the ground and who had been a favourite of the dead stepmother and hated maeve for her sake stepped forward and said 
O oh, king of Erin, never yet has the daughter of a king been freely given in marriage to any save a battle champion, and that stripling there has never struck his spear against the warrior's shield. A murmur of approbation rose from the jealous princes, and Congal, the bravest of them all, stepped out from the ranks and said, The druid speaks the truth, O oh king. That stripling has never faced a battle champion yet, and, speaking for all the nobles of your land, I challenge him to fight any one of us, and as he is young and unused to arms, we are willing that the youngest and least experienced amongst us should be set against him. When Congal had spoken, the nobles, in approval of his words, struck their shields with their swords, and the brazen sound descended to the skies. The face of the princess, blushing a moment before like a rose, became as white as a lily, but the colour returned to her cheeks when she heard Enda's voice ringing loud and clear. "'It is true, O king,' said he, "'that I have never used my spear in battle yet. The prince Congal has challenged me to meet the youngest and least experienced of the chiefs of Erin. I have risked my life already for your daughter's sake.' I would face death a thousand times for the chance of winning her for my bride, but I would scorn to claim her hand if I dared not meet the boldest battle champion of the nobles of Erin, and here before you, O king, and bards, druids, and nobles, and chiefs of Erin, and here, in the presence of the Lady Maeve, I challenge the boldest of them all. The king's eyes flashed with joy as he listened to the brave words of Enda. It is well, said the king. The contest shall take place tomorrow on the lawn outside our palace gates. But before our assembly dissolves, I call on you, nobles and chiefs of Erin, to name your boldest champion. Loud cries of Congal, Congal, answered the king's speech. Are you willing, Congal? asked the king. Willing, O king, answered Congal. It is well, said the king. We shall all meet again tonight in our banquet hall. And the king, with the princess Maeve on his arm, attended by his bards and druids, entered the palace, and the chiefs and nobles went their several ways. At the feast that night the princess sat beside the king, and Enda beside the princess, and the bards and druids, nobles and chiefs, took their places in due order. And the bards sang songs of love and battle, and never merrier hours were spent than those which passed away that night in the banquet halls of Erin's king. When the feast was over, Enda retired to his apartment to spend the night dreaming of the princess Maeve, and Congal went to his quarters, but not to sleep or dream, for the druid who had provoked the contest came to him bringing his golden wand and all night long the druid was weaving spells to charm the shield and spear and helmet of Congal, to make them invulnerable in the battle of the morrow. But while Enda lay dreaming of the princess Maeve, the little fairy woman who gave him the water dress and crystal helmet and shining spear on the banks of the Boyne, slid into his room, and she placed beside his couch a silver helmet and a silver shield. And she rubbed the helmet, and the shield, and the blue blade and shaft of his spear, with the juice of the red Roman berries, and she let a drop fall upon his face and hands, and then she slid out as silently as she came. When the morning broke, Enda sprang from his couch, and he could hardly believe his eyes when he saw the silver shield and helmet. At the sight of them he longed for the hour of battle, and he watched with eager gaze the sun climbing the sky, and after hours of suspense he heard the trumpet sound and the clangor of the hollow shields struck by the hard-pointed spears. Putting on the helmet and fastening the shield upon his left arm, and taking the spear in his right hand, he stepped out bravely to the fight. The edge of the lawn before the palace gates was ringed by the princes, nobles, and chiefs of Erin and the palace walls were thronged by all the beauties of the court and all the noble ladies of the land. And on his throne, surrounded by his druids, his brihons, and his bards, was the king of Erin, and at his feet sat the lovely lady Maeve. 
as enda stepped out upon the lawn he saw congal advancing from the ranks of the nobles and the two champions approached each other until they met right in front of the throne then both turned towards the throne and bowed to the king and the princess maeve and then facing each other again they retired a space and when their spears were poised ready for battle the king gave the signal which was answered by the clang of stricken shields and congal and enda launched their gleaming spears they flashed like lightning in the sunlit air and in a second congal's had broken against enda's shield but enda's piercing congal's helmet hurled him senseless on the plain the nobles and chiefs could hardly realize that in that single second their boldest champion was overthrown but when they saw him stretched motionless on the grassy sword from out their ranks six warriors advanced to where the chieftain lay and sadly they bore him away upon their battle shields and enda remained victor upon the field and then the king's voice rang out as clear as the sound of a trumpet in the still morning bards and brions princes and nobles and chiefs of erin enda has proved himself a battle champion and who amongst you now will dare gainsay his right to claim my daughter for his bride and no answer came but when he summoned enda to his throne and placed the lady's hand in his a cheer arose from the great assembly that proved that jealousy was extinguished in all hearts and that all believed that enda was worthy of the winsome bride and never since that day although a thousand years have passed was there in all the world a brighter and gayer wedding than the wedding of enda and the princess maeve end of section two recording by phone Section 3 of The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Broach. The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy. The Enchanted Cave. A long, long time ago, Prince Cuglas, master of the hounds to High King of Erin, set out from Terra to the chase. As he was leaving the palace, the light mists were drifting away from the hilltops, and the rays of the morning sun were falling aslant on the Grenan, or the sunny bower of Princess Aelin. Glancing toward it, the prince doffed his plumed and jeweled hunting cap, and the princess answered his salute by a wave of her little hand that was as white as a wild rose in the hedges in june and leaning from her bower she watched the huntsman until his tossing plumes were hidden by the green waving branches of the woods the princess aelin was over head and ears in love with cuglas and cuglas was over head and ears in love with the princess aelin and he believed that never was summer morning half as bright or as sweet or as fair as she the glimpse which he had just caught of her filled his heart with delight and almost put all thought of hunting out of his head when suddenly the tuneful cries of the hounds answered by a hundred echoes from the groves broke upon his ear the dogs had started a dappled deer that bounded away through the forest the prince spurring his gallant steed pushed on in eager pursuit on through the forest sped the deer through soft green secret ways and flowery dells then out from the forest up the heathery hills and over long stretches of moorland and across brown rushing streams sometimes in view of the hounds sometimes lost to sight but always ahead of them all day the chase continued and at last when the sun was sinking the dogs were close upon the panting deer and the prince believed he was about to secure his game when the deer suddenly disappeared through the mouth of a cave which opened before him the dogs followed at his heels and the prince endeavored to rein in his steed but the impetuous animal bore him on and soon was clattering over the stony floor of the cave in perfect darkness cuglas could hear ahead of him the cries of the hounds growing fainter and fainter as they increased the distance between them and him then the cries ceased altogether and the only sound the prince heard was the noise of his horse's hoofs sounding in the hollow cave once more he endeavored to check his career 
but the reins broke in his hands and in that instant the prince felt the horse had taken a plunge into a gulf and was sinking down and down as a stone cast from the summit of a cliff sinks down into the sea at last the horse struck the ground again and the prince was almost thrown out of his saddle but he succeeded in regaining his seat then on through the darkness galloped the steed and when he came into the light the prince's eyes were for some time unable to bear it but when he got used to the brightness he saw he was galloping over a grassy plain and in the distance he perceived the hounds rushing toward a wood faintly visible through the luminous summer haze the prince galloped on and as he approached the wood he saw coming towards him a comely champion wearing a shiny brown cloak fastened by a bright bronze spear-like brooch and bearing a white hazel wand in one hand and a single-edged sword with a hilt made from the tooth of a seahorse in the other the prince knew by the dress of the champion and by his wand and sword that he was a royal herald as the herald came close to him the prince's steed stopped of its own accord you are welcome cuglas said the herald and i have been sent by the prince's creed to greet you and lead you to her court where you have been so long expected i know not how this may be said cuglas how it has come about i shall tell you as we go along said the herald the princess creed is the queen of the floating island and it chanced once upon a day when she was visiting her fairy kinsmen who dwell in one of the pleasant hills that lie near terra she saw you with the high king and the princes and nobles of erin following the chase and seeing you her heart went out to you and wishing to bring you to her court she sent one of her nymphs in the form of a deer to lure you on through the cave which is the entrance to this land i am deeply honored by the preference shown me by the princess said cuglas but i may not tarry in her court for above in erin there is the lady aelin the loveliest of all ladies who grace the royal palace and before the princes and chiefs of erin she is promised to be my bride of that i know not said the herald but a true champion like you cannot i know refuse to come with me to the court of the princess creed as the herald had said these words the prince and he were on the verge of the wood and they entered upon a mossy pathway that broadened out as they advanced until it was as wide as one of the great roads of erin before they had gone very far the prince heard the tinkling of silver bells in the distance and almost as soon as he heard them he saw coming up towards him a troop of warriors on coal-black steeds all the warriors wore helmet of shining silver and cloaks of blue silk and on the horse's breast were crescents of silver on which were hung tiny silver bells shaking out music with the motion of the horses as the prince approached the champions they lowered their spears and dividing in two lines the prince and the herald passed between the ranks and the champions forming again followed on behind the prince at last they passed through the wood and they found themselves on a green plain speckled with flowers and they had not gone far when the prince saw coming toward him a hundred champions on snow-white steeds and around the breast of the steeds were crescents of gold from which were hanging little golden bells the warriors all wore golden helmets and the shafts of their shining spears were of gold and golden sandals on their feet and yellow silken mantles fell down over their shoulders and when the prince came near them they lowered their lances and then they turned their horses heads around and marched before him it was not long until above the pleasant jingle of the bells the prince heard the measured strains of music and he saw coming towards him a band of harpers dressed in green and gold and when the harpers had saluted the prince they marched in front of the cavalcade playing all the time and it was not long until they came to a stream that ran like a blue ribbon around the foot of a green hill on the top of which was a sparkling palace the stream was crossed by a golden bridge so narrow that the horsemen had to go two by two the herald asked the prince to halt and to allow all the champions to go before him and the cavalcade ascended the hill the sunlight brightly glancing on helmet and on lance and when it reached the palace the horsemen filed around the walls when at length the prince and herald crossed the bridge and began to climb the hill the prince thought he felt the ground moving under them and on looking back he could see no sign of the golden bridge 
and the blue stream had already become as wide as a great river and was becoming wider every second you are on the floating island now said the herald and before you is the palace of the princess creed at that moment the queen came out through the palace door and the prince was so dazzled by her beauty that for only the golden bracelet he wore upon his right arm under the sleeve of his silk tunic he might almost have forgotten the princess Aelin. this bracelet was made by the dwarves who dwell in the heart of the scandinavian mountains and was sent with other costly presents by the king of scandinavia to the king of erin and he gave it to the princess and it was on the virtue of this bracelet that whoever was wearing it could not forget the person who gave it to them and it could never be loosened from the arm by any art or magic spell but if the wearer for even a single moment liked any one better than the person who gave it to him that very moment the bracelet fell off from the arm and could never again be fastened on when the princess promised her hand in marriage to prince cuglas she closed the bracelet on his arm the fairy queen knew nothing about the bracelet and she hoped that before the prince was long in the floating island he would forget all about the princess you are welcome cuglas said the queen as she held out her hand and cuglas having thanked her for her welcome entered the palace together you must be very weary after your long journey said the queen my page will lead you to your apartments where a bath of the cool blue waters of the lake has been made ready for you and when you have taken your bath the pages will lead you to the banquet hall where the feast is spread at the feast the prince was seated beside the queen and she talked to him of all the pleasures that were in store for him in fairyland where pain and sickness and sorrow and old age are unknown and where every rosy hour that flies is brighter than the one that has fled before it and when the feast was ended the queen opened the dance with the prince and it was not until the moon was high above the floating island that the prince retired to rest he was so tired after his journey and the dancing that he fell into a sound sleep when he awoke the next morning the sun was shining brightly and he heard outside the palace the jingle of bells and the music of baying hounds and his heart was stirred by memories of the many pleasant days on which he had led the chase over the plains and through the green woods of terra he looked out through the window and he saw all the fairy champions mounted on their steeds ready for the chase and at their head the fairy queen and at that moment the pages came to say the queen wished to know if he would join them and the prince went out and found his steed ready saddled and bridled and they spent the day hunting in the forest that stretched away for miles behind the palace and the night in feasting and dancing when the prince awoke the following morning he was summoned by the pages to the presence of the queen the prince found the queen on the lawn outside the palace surrounded by her court we shall go to the lake today, day said the queen and taking his arm she led him along the water's edge all the courtiers following and when she was close to the water she waved her wand and in a second a thousand boats shining like a glass shot up from beneath the lake and set their bows against the bank the queen and cuglas stepped into one and when they were seated two fairy harpers took their places in the prow all the other boats were soon thronged by fairies and when the queen waved her wand again an awning of purple silk rose over the boat and silken awnings of various colors over the others and the royal boat moved off from the bank followed by all the rest and in every boat sat a harper with a golden harp and when the queen waved her wand for the third time the harper struck the trembling chords and to the sound of the delightful music the boats glided over the sunlit lake on they went until they approached the mouth of a gentle river sliding down between the banks clad with trees up the river close to the bank and under the drooping trees they sailed and when they came to a bend in the river from which the lake could no longer be seen they pushed their prows in against the bank and the queen and cuglas and all the party left the boats and went on under the trees until they came to a mossy glade then the queen waved her wand and silken couches were spread under the trees and she and cuglas sat on one apart from the others 
and the courtiers took their place in proper order. The queen waved her wand again, and the wind shook the trees above them, and the most luscious fruit that was ever tasted fell down into their hands. When the feast was over, there was dancing in the glades to the music of the harps, and when they were tired dancing, they set out for the boats. The moon was rising above the trees as they sailed away over the lake. It was not long until they reached the bank below the fairy palace. Well, between the hunting in the forest and the sailing over the lake and dancing in the greenwood glade and the banquet hall, the days passed, but all the time the prince was thinking of Princess Aelin, and one moonlit night when he was lying awake on his couch thinking of her, a shadow was suddenly cast on the floor. The prince looked toward the window, and what should he see sitting on the sill outside but a little woman tapping the pane with a golden bodkin? The prince jumped from his couch and opened the window, and the little woman floated on the moonbeams into the room and sat down on the floor. "'You are thinking of Princess Aelin, said the little woman. "'I never think of anyone else,' said the prince. "'I know that,' said the little woman. "'And it's because of your love for each other, "'and because her mother was a friend to me in the days gone by, "'that I have come here to try and help you. "'But there is not much time for talking. "'The night advances. "'At the bank below a boat awaits you. "'Step into it, and it will lead you to the mainland. "'When you reach it, you will find before you a path "'that will take you to the green fields of Erin and the plains of Terra. "'I know you will have to face danger. "'I know not what kind of danger, but whatever it may be, "'do not draw your sword before you tread upon the mainland, "'for if you do, you shall never reach it, "'and the boat will come back again to the floating island.' Now go, and may luck be with you. And saying this, the little woman climbed up on the moonbeams and disappeared. The prince left the palace and descended to the lake, and there before him he saw a glistening boat. He stepped into it, and the boat went on and on beneath the moon, and at last he saw the mainland, and he could trace a winding path going away from the shore. The sight filled his heart with joy. But suddenly the milky white moonshine died away, and looking up to the sky he saw the moon turn fiery red, and the waters of the lake, shining like silver a moment before, took a blood-red hue, and a wind arose that stirred the waters, and they leaped up against the little boat, tossing it from side to side. While Cuglas was wondering at the change, he heard a strange, unearthly noise ahead of him, and a bristling monster lifting its claws above the water in a moment was beside the boat and struck one of his claws in the left arm of the prince and pierced the flesh to the bone. Maddened by the pain, the prince drew his sword and chopped off the monster's claw. The monster disappeared beneath the lake, and as it did so the color of the water changed, and the silver moonlight shone down from the sky again. But the boat no longer went on towards the mainland, but sped back towards the floating island, while forth from the island came a fleet of fairy boats to meet it, led by the shallop of the fairy queen. The queen greeted the prince as if she knew not of his attempted flight, and to the music of the harps the fleet returned to the palace. The next day passed, and the night came, and again the prince was lying on the couch, thinking of Princess Salen and again he saw the shadow on the floor and heard the tapping against the window. When he opened it, the little woman slid down into the room. "'You failed last night,' she said. "'But I come to give you another chance. Tomorrow the queen must set out on a visit to her fairy kinsmen, who dwell in the green hill near the plain of Terra. She cannot take you with her, for if your feet once touched the green grass that grows in the fruitful fields of Erin, she could never bring you back again. And so, when you find she has left the palace, go at once into the banquet hall and look behind the throne. You will see a small door let down into the ground. Pull this up and descend the steps which you will see. Where they lead to I cannot tell. What dangers may be before you I do not know, but this I know, if you accept anything, no matter what it is, 
from any one that you may meet on your way you shall not set foot on the soil of erin and having said this the little woman rising from the floor floated out through the window the prince returned to his couch and the next morning as soon as he heard the queen had left the palace he hastened to the banquet hall he discovered the door and descended the steps and he found himself in a gloomy and lonesome valley jagged mountains black as night rose on either side and huge rocks seemed ready to topple down upon him at every step through broken clouds a watery moon shed a faint fitful light that came and went as the clouds driven by a moaning wind passed over the valley Tuglas, nothing daunted pushed on boldly until a bank of cloud shut out completely the struggling moon and closing over the valley covered it like a pall leaving him in perfect darkness at the same moment the moaning wind died away and with it died away all sound the darkness and the death-like silence sent an icy chill to the heart of Cuglas. he held his hand close to his eyes but he saw it not he shouted that he might hear the sound of his own voice but he heard it not he stamped his foot on the rocky ground but no sound was returned to him he rattled his sword in its brazen scabbard but it gave no answer back to him his heart grew colder and colder when suddenly the cloud above him was rent in a dozen places and lightning flashed through the valley and the thunder rolled over the echoing mountains in the lurid glare of the lightning Cuglas saw a hundred ghostly forms sweeping toward him uttering as they came nearer and nearer shrieks so terrible that the silence of death could be more easily borne Cuglas turned to escape, but they hemmed him round, and pressed their clammy hands upon his face. With a yell of horror he drew his sword and slashed about him, and at that very moment the forms vanished, the thunder ceased, and the dark clouds passed, and the sun shone out as bright as on a summer day. Then Cuglas knew the forms he had seen were those of the wild people of the glen. With renewed courage he pursued his way through the valley and after three or four windings it took him out upon a sandy desert he had no sooner set foot on the desert than he heard behind him a crashing sound louder than thunder he looked around and he saw that the walls of mountain through which he had just passed had fallen into the valley and filled it up so that he could no longer tell where it had been the sun was beating fiercely on the desert and the sands were almost as hot as burning cinders and as Cuglas advanced over them, his body became dried up, and his tongue clove to the roof of his mouth, and when his thirst was at its height, a fountain of sparkling water sprang up in the burning plain a few paces in front of him. When he came up quite close to it, and stretched out his parched hands to cool them in the limpid waters, the fountain vanished as suddenly as it appeared. With great pain, and almost choking with heat and thirst, he struggled on, and again the fountain sprang up in front of him and moved before him almost within his reach at last he came to the end of the desert and he saw a green hill upon which a pathway climbed but as he came to the foot of the hill there sitting right in his way was a beautiful fairy holding out towards him a crystal cup over the rim of which flowed water as clear as crystal unable to resist the temptation the prince seized the cold bright goblet and drank the water when he did so his thirst vanished but the fairy and the green hill and the burning desert disappeared and he was standing in the forest behind the palace of the fairy queen that evening the queen returned and at the feast she talked as gaily to the prince as if she knew not of his attempt to leave the floating island and the prince spoke as gaily as he could to her although in his heart there was a sadness when he remembered that if he had only dashed away the crystal cup he would be at that moment in the royal banquet hall of terra sitting beside the princess Aileen. and he thought the feast would never end but it was over at last and the prince returned to his apartments and that night as he lay on the couch he kept his eyes fixed on the window but hours passed and there was no sign of any one at long last, when he had given up all hope of seeing her, he heard a tapping at the window. He got up and opened it, and the little woman came in. You failed again today, she said. Failed just at the very moment when you were about to step onto the green hills of Erin. 
i can give you only one more chance it will be your last the queen will go hunting in the morning join the hunt and when you are separated from the rest of the party in the wood throw your reins upon your horse's neck and he will lead you to the edge of the lake then cast this golden bodkin into the lake in the direction of the mainland and a golden bridge will be thrown across over which you can pass safely to the fields of erin but take care you do not draw your sword for if you do your steed will bear you back again to the floating island and here you must remain for ever then handing the bodkin to the prince and saying good-bye the little woman disappeared the next morning the queen and the prince and all the court went out to hunt and a fleet white deer started before them and the royal party pressed after him in pursuit the prince's steed outstripped all the others and when he was alone the prince flung the reins upon his horse's neck and before long he came to the edge of the lake then the prince cast the bodkin on to the water and a golden bridge was thrown across to the mainland and the horse galloped on to it when the prince was more than half way he saw riding towards him a champion wearing a silver helmet and carrying on his left arm a silver shield and holding in his right hand a gleaming sword as he came nearer he struck his shield with his sword and challenged the prince to battle the prince's sword almost leapt out of its scabbard at the martial sound and like a true knight of terra he dashed against his foe and swinging his sword above his head with one blow he clove the silver helmet and the strange warrior reeled from his horse and fell upon the golden bridge the prince content with this achievement spurred his horse to pass the fallen champion but the horse refused to stir and the bridge broke in two almost at his feet and the part of it between him and the mainland disappeared beneath the lake carrying with it the horse and the body of the champion and before the prince could recover from his surprise his steed wheeled around and was galloping back when he reached the land he rushed through the forest and the prince was not able to pull him up until he came to the palace door all that night the prince lay awake on his couch with his eyes fixed upon the window but no shadow fell upon the floor and there was no tapping at the pane and with a heavy heart he joined the hunting party in the morning and day followed day and his heart was sadder and sadder and found no pleasure in the joys and delights of fairyland and when all the palace were at rest he used to roam through the forest always thinking of the princess ailing and hoping against hope that the little woman would come again to him but at last he began to despair of ever seeing her it chanced one night he rambled so far that he found himself on the verge of the lake at the very spot from which the golden bridge had been thrown across the waters and as he gazed wistfully upon them a boat shot up and came swiftly to the bank who should he see sitting in the stern but the little woman ah cuglas cuglas she said i gave you three chances and you failed in all of them i should have borne the pain inflicted by the monster's claws said cuglas i should have borne the thirst on the sandy desert and dashed the crystal cup untasted from the fairy's hand but i could never have faced the nobles and chiefs of erin if i had refused to meet the challenge of the battle champion on the golden bridge and you would have been no true knight of erin and you would have not have been worthy of the wee girl who loves you the bonny princess ailin if you had refused to meet it said the little woman but for all that you can never return to the fair hills of erin but cheer up cuglas there are mossy ways and forest paths and nestling bowers in fairyland lonely they are i know in your eyes now said the little woman but maybe she added with a laugh as musical as the ripple on a streamlet when the summer is in the air maybe you won't always think them so lonely you think i'll forget aelin for the fairy queen said cuglas with a sigh i don't think anything of the kind she said then what do you mean said the prince oh i mean what i mean said the little woman but i can't stop here all night talking to you and indeed it is in your bed you ought to be yourself so now good night and i have no more to say except that perhaps if you happen to be here this night week at this very hour when the moon will be on the waters 
you will see. But no matter what you will see, she said, I must be off. And before the prince could say another word, the boat sped away from the bank, and he was alone. He went back to the palace, and he fell asleep that night, only to dream of the princess ailing. As for the princess, she was pining away in the palace of Terra. The color had fled from her cheeks, and her eyes, which had been once so bright they would have lighted darkness like a star, lost nearly all their luster, and the king's leeches could do nothing for her. At last they gave up all hope, and the king and queen of Erin and all the ladies of the court watched her couch by night and by day, sadly waiting for her last hour. At length one day, when the sun was shining brightly over Terra's plain, and its light, softened by the intervening curtains, was falling into the sick chamber, the royal watchers noticed a sweet change come over the face of the princess. The bloom of love and youth were flushing on her cheeks, and from her eyes shone out the old, soft, tender light. They began to hope that she was about to be restored to them, when suddenly the room was in darkness, as if the night had swept across the sky and blotted out the sun. Then they heard the sound of fairy music, and over the couch where the princess lay they beheld a gleam of golden light, but only for a moment, and again there was perfect darkness, and the fairy music ceased. Then, as suddenly as it came, the darkness vanished. The softened sunlight once more filled the chamber and rested upon the couch. But the couch was empty, and the royal watchers, looking at each other, said in whispers, the fairies have carried away the princess Aileen to fairyland. Well, that very day the prince roamed by himself through the forest, counting the hours until the day would fade in the sky and the moon come climbing up, and at last, when it was shining full above the waters, he went down to the verge of the lake, and he looked out over the gleaming surface, watching for the vision promised by the little woman. But he could see nothing and was about to turn away when he heard the faint sound of fairy music. He listened and listened, and the sound came nearer and clearer, and away in the distance, like drops of glistening water breaking the level of the lake, he saw a fleet of fairy boats, and he thought it was the fairy queen sailing into the moonlight. And it was the fairy queen, and soon he was able to recognize the royal shallop leading the others. And as it came close to the bank, he saw the little woman sitting in the prow between the little harpers, and at the stern was the fairy queen, and by her side the lady of his heart, the princess Aileen. In a second the boat was against the bank, and the princess in his arms, and he kissed her again and again. And have you never a kiss for me? said the little woman, tapping his hand with the little gold bodkin. A kiss and a dozen, said Cuglas, as he caught the little fairy up in his arms. Oh, fie, Cuglas, said the queen. Oh, the princess isn't one bit jealous, said the little woman. Are you, Aileen? Indeed I am not, said Aileen. And you should not be, for never lady yet had truer knight than Cuglas. I loved him, and I love him dearly. I lured him here, hoping that in the delights of fairyland he might forget you. It was all in vain. I know now that there is one thing no fairy power above or below the stars or beneath the waters can ever subdue, and that is love. And here together forever shall you and Cuglas dwell, where old age shall never come upon you, and where pain or sorrow or sickness is unknown. And Cuglas never returned to the fair hills of Erin, and ages passed away since the morning he followed the hounds into the fatal cave. But his story was remembered by the firesides, and sometimes, even yet, the herd boy watching his cattle in the field hears the tuneful cry of hounds, and follows it till it leads him into a darksome cave. And as fearfully as he listens to the sound, becoming fainter and fainter, he hears the clatter of hoofs over the stony floor, and to this day the cave bears the name of the prince who entered it, never to return. End of section 3. Recording by Ron Broach. Section 4 of The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Jones. The Golden Spears and Other Fairy Tales by Edmund Leamy. The Huntsman's Son. A long, long time ago, there lived in a little hut on the borders of a great forest a huntsman and his wife and son. From his earliest years, the boy, whose name was Fergus, used to hunt with his father in the forest. He grew up strong and active, sure and swift-footed as a deer, and as free and fearless as the wind. He was tall and handsome, as supple as a mountain ash. His lips were as red as its berries. His eyes were as blue as the skies in spring, and his hair fell down over his shoulders like a shower of gold. His heart was as light as a bird's, and no bird was fonder of green woods and waving branches. He had lived since his birth in the hut in the forest, and had never wished to leave it, until one winter's night a wandering minstrel sought shelter there, and paid for his night's lodging with songs of love and battle. Ever since that night, Fergus pined for another life. He no longer found joy in the music of the hounds or in the cries of the huntsmen in forest glades. He yearned for the chance of battle and the clang of shields, and the fierce shouts of fighting warriors. And he spent all his spare hours practicing on the harp and learning the use of arms, for in those days the bravest warriors were also bards. In this way the spring and summer and autumn passed. And when the winter came again, it chanced that on a stormy night, when thunder was rattling through the forest, smiting the huge oaks and hurling them to crashing to the earth, Fergus lay awake, thinking of his present lot, and wondering what the future might have in store for him. The lightning was playing around the hut, and every now and then a flash brightened up the interior. After a peal, louder than any which had preceded it, Fergus heard three loud knocks at the door. He called out to his parents that someone was knocking. If that is so, said his father, open at once. This is no night to keep a poor wanderer outside our door. Fergus did as he was bidden, and as he opened the door, a flash of lightning showed him, standing at the threshold, a little wizened old man with a small harp under his arm. Come in and welcome, said Fergus, and the little man stepped into the room. It is a wild night, neighbors, said he. It is indeed a wild night, said the huntsman and his wife, who had got up and dressed themselves. And sorry we are, we have no better shelter or better fare to offer you, but we give you the best we have. A king cannot do more than his best, said the little man. The huntsman's wife lit the fire, and soon the pine logs flashed up into a blaze and made the hut bright and warm. She then brought forth a peggin of milk and a cake of barley bread. You must be hungry, sir, she said. Hungry I am, said he, but I wouldn't ask for better fare than this if I were in the king's palace. Thank you kindly, sir, said she, and I hope you will eat enough, and that will do you good. And while you are eating your supper, said the huntsman, I'll make you a bed of fresh rushes. Don't put yourself to that trouble, said the little man. When I have done my supper, I'll lie down here by the fire, if it is pleasing to you, and I'll sleep like a top till morning. And now go back to your beds, and leave me to myself, and maybe some time, when you won't be expecting it, I'll do a good turn for your kindness to the poor wayfarer. Oh, it's no kindness at all, said the huntsman's wife. It would be a queer thing if an Irish cabin would not give shelter and welcome in a wild night like this. So good night now, and we hope you will sleep well. Good night, said the little man, and may you and yours never sup sorrow until your dying day. The huntsman and his wife and Fergus then went back to their beds, and the little man, having finished his supper, curled himself up by the fire, and was soon fast asleep. About an hour after, a loud clap of thunder awakened Fergus, and before it had died away, he heard three knocks at the door. He aroused his parents and told them. "'Get up at once,' said his mother. "'This is no night to keep a stranger outside our door.' Fergus rose and opened the door, and a flash of lightning showed him a little old woman, with a shuttle in her hand, standing outside. "'Come in and welcome,' said he and the little old woman stepped into the room. "'Blessings be upon them who give welcome to a wanderer on a wild night like this,' said the old woman. "'And who wouldn't give welcome on a night like this?' said the huntsman's wife, coming forward with a peg of milk and a barley cake in her hand. "'And sorry we are that we have not better fare to offer you.' "'Enough is as good as a feast,' said the little woman, "'and now go back to your beds and leave me to myself.' "'Not till I shake down a bed of rushes for you,' said the huntsman's wife." Don't mind the rushes, said the little woman. Go back to your beds. I'll sleep here by the fire. The huntsman's wife went to bed, and the little old woman, having eaten her supper, lay down by the fire and was soon fast asleep. About an hour later, another clap of thunder startled Fergus. Again, he heard three knocks at the door. 
He roused his parents, but he did not wait for orders from them. He opened the door, and a flash of lightning showed him outside the threshold a low-sized, shaggy, wild-looking horse. And Fergus knew it was the Puka, the wild horse of the mountains. Bold as Fergus was, his heart beat quickly as he saw fire issuing from the Puka's nostrils. But, banishing fear, he cried out, Come in and welcome. Welcome you are, said the huntsman, and sorry we are that we have not better shelter or fare to offer you. I couldn't wish a better welcome, said the Puka, as he came over near the fire and sat down on his haunches. Maybe you would like a little bit of this, Master Puka, said the huntsman's wife as she offered him a barley cake. I never tasted anything sweeter in my life, says the Puka, crunching it between his teeth, and now if you can give me a sup of milk, I'll want for nothing. The huntsman's wife brought him a peg of milk. When he had drunk it, now, says the Puka, go back to your beds, and I'll curl myself up by the fire and sleep like a top till morning and soon everybody in the hut was fast asleep. When the morning came, the storm had gone, and the sun was shining through the windows of the hut. At the song of the lark, Fergus got up, and no one in the world was ever more surprised than he when he saw no sign of the little old man, or the little old woman, or the wild horse of the mountains. His parents were also surprised, and they all thought that they must have been dreaming, until they saw the empty peggins around the fire, and some pieces of broken bread. And they did not know what to think of it at all. From that day forward, the desire grew stronger in the heart of Fergus for a change of life, and one day he told his parents that he was resolved to seek his fortune. He said he wished to be a soldier, and that he would set out for the king's palace and try to join the ranks of the Fenny. About a week afterwards, he took leave of his parents, and having received their blessing, he struck out for the road that led to the palace of the High King of Erin. The manly figure of Fergus, his gallant bearing, and handsome face all told in his favor. But before he could be received into the Fenian ranks, he had to prove that he could play the harp like a bard, that he could contend with staff and shield against nine Fenian warriors, that he could run with plaited hair through the tangled forest without loosening a single hair, and that in his course he could jump over trees as high as his head and stoop under trees as low as his knee, and that he could run so lightly that the rotten twigs should not break under his feet. Fergus proved equal to all the tests thanks to the wandering minstrel who taught him the use of the harp, to his own brave heart, and to his forest training. He was enrolled in the second battalion of the Fenny, and before long he was its bravest and ablest champion. At that very time it happened that the niece of the High King of Erin was staying with the king and queen in their palace at Tara. The princess was the loveliest lady in all the land. She was as proud as she was beautiful. The princes and chieftains of Erin in vain sought her hand in marriage. From Alba and Spain and the far-off isles of Greece, kings came to woo her. From the northern lands came vikings in stately galleys with brazen prows, whose oarsmen tore the white foam from the emerald seas as they swept toward the Irish coasts. But the lady had vowed she would wed with no one except a battle champion who could excel in music the chief bard of the high king of Erin, who could outstrip on his steed in the great race of Tara the white steed of the plains and who could give her as a wedding robe a garment of all the colors of the rainbow, so finely spun that when folded up it would fit in the palm of her small white hand. To fulfill these three conditions was impossible for all her suitors, and it seemed as if the loveliest lady of the land would go unmarried to her grave. It chanced that once, on a day when the Fenian battalions were engaged in a hurling match, Fergus beheld the lady watching the match from her sunny bower. He no sooner saw her than he fell over head and ears in love with her, and he thought of her by night, and he thought of her by day, and believing that his love was hopeless, he often wished he had never left his forest home. The great fair of Tara was coming on, and all the Fenny were busy from morning till night, practicing feats of arms and games, in order to take part in the contests to be held during the fair. And Fergus, knowing that the princess would be present, determined to do his best to win the prizes which were to be contended for before the lady's eyes. The fair began on the 1st of August, but for a whole week before the five great roads of Erin were thronged with people of all sorts, princes and warriors on their steeds, battle champions in their chariots, harpers in hundreds, smiths with gleaming spears and shields and harness, for battle steeds and chariots, troops of men and boys leading racehorses, jewelers with gold drinking horns and brooches and pins and earrings and costly gems of all kinds and chessmen boards of silver and gold and golden and silver chessmen and bags of woven brass, dyers with their many-colored fabrics, 
bands of jugglers, drovers goading on herds of cattle, shepherds driving their sheep, huntsmen with spoils of the chase, dwellers in the lakes or by the fish-abounding rivers with salmon and speckled trout, and countless numbers of peasants on horseback and on foot, all wending their way to the great meeting-place by the mound, which a thousand years before had been raised over the grave of the great queen, for there the fair was to be held. On the opening day the high king, attended by the four kings of Erin, set out from the palace, and with them went the queen and the ladies of the court in sparkling chariots. The princess rode in the chariot with the high queen, under an awning made of the wings of birds, to protect them from the rays of the sun. Following the queen were the court ladies in other chariots, under awnings of purple or of yellow silk. Then came the Brehens, the great judges of the land, and the chief bards of the high court of Tara, and the druids, crowned with oak leaves, and carrying wands of divination in their hands. When the royal party reached the ground, it took its place in enclosures right up against the monumental mound. The high king sat with the four kings of Erin, all wearing their golden helmets, for they wore their diadems in battle only. In an enclosure next to the kings sat the queen and the princess and all the ladies of the court. At either side of the royal pavilions were others for the thames and ladies and nobles and chiefs of different degrees forming part of a circle on the plain, and the stands and benches for the people were so arranged as to complete the circle, and in the round green space within it, so that all might hear and see, the contests were to take place. At a signal from the king, who was greeted with a thunderous cheer, the heralds rode round the circle, and having struck their sounding shields three times with their swords, they made a solemn proclamation of peace. Then was sung the by all the assembled bards, to the accompaniment of their harps, the chant in honor of the mighty dead. When this was ended, again the heralds struck their shields, and the contests began. The first contest was the contest of spear-throwing between the champions of the seven battalions of the Feni. When the seven champions took their places in front of the royal enclosure, everyone, even the proud princess, was struck by the manly beauty and noble bearing of Fergus. The champions poised their spears, and at a stroke from the heralds upon their shields, the seven spears sped flashing through the air. They all struck the ground, shafts up, and it was seen that two were standing side by side in advance of the rest. One belonged to Fergus, the other to the great chief Oscar. The contest for the prize then lay between Oscar and Fergus, and when they stood in front of the king, holding their spears aloft, every heart was throbbing with excitement. Once more the heralds struck their shields, and, swifter than the lightning's flash, forth went the spears, and when Fergus's spear was seen shivering in the ground a full length ahead of the great chief Oscars, the air was shaken by a wild cheer that was heard far beyond the plains of Tara. And as Fergus approached the high king to receive the prize, the cheers were renewed. But Fergus thought more of the winsome glance of the princess than he did of the prize or the sounding cheers. And Princess Marine was almost sorry for her vow for her heart was touched by the beauty of the Fenian champion. Other contests followed, and the day passed, and the night fell, and while the Fenian warriors were reveling in their camps, the heart of Fergus, victor as he was, was sad and low. He escaped from his companions and stole away to his native forest, for, when the heart is sick and sorest, there is balsam in the forest, there is balsam in the forest for its pain. And as he lay under the spreading branches, Watching the stars glancing through the leaves and listening to the slumberous murmur of the waters, a strange peace came over him. But in the camp which he had left, and in the vast multitude on the plains of Tara, there was stir and revelry, the babbling speculation as to the contest of tomorrow, the contest which was to decide whether the chief bard of Aaron was to hold his own against all comers, or yield the palm. For rumor said that a great scald had come from the northern lands to compete with the Irish bard. At last, over the Fenian camp, and over the great plain and multitude that thronged it, sleep fell, clothing them with a silence as deep as that which dwelt in the forest, where, dreaming of the princess, Fergus lay. He awoke at the first notes of the birds, but though he felt he ought to go back to his companions and be witness of the contest which might determine whether the princess was to be another's bride, his great love and his utter despair of winning her so oppressed him that he lay as motionless as a broken reed. He scarcely heard the music of the birds, and paid no heed to the murmur of the brook rushing by his feet. The crackling of branches near him barely disturbed him, 
but when a shadow fell across his eyes he looked up gloomily and saw or thought he saw someone standing before him he started up and who should he see but the little wizened old man who found shelter in his father's hut on a stormy night this is a nice place for a battle champion to be this is a nice place for you to be on the day which is to decide who will be successful suitor of the princess what is it to me said fergus who is to win her since i cannot i told you said the little man the night you opened the door for me that the time might come when i might be able to do a good turn for you and yours the time has come take this harp and my luck go with you and in the contest of the bards to-day you'll reap the reward of the kindness you did when you opened your door to the poor old wayfarer in the midnight storm the little man handed his harp to fergus and disappeared as swiftly as the wind that passes through the leaves fergus concealing the harp under his silken cloak reached the camp before his comrades had aroused themselves from sleep at length the hour arrived when the great contest was to take place the king gave the signal and as the chief bard of erin was seen ascending the mound in front of the royal enclosures he was greeted with a roar of cheers but at the first note of his harp silence like that of night fell on the mighty gathering as he moved his fingers softly over the strings every heart was hushed filled with a sense of balmy rest the lark soaring and singing above his head paused mute and motionless in the still air and no sound was heard over the spacious plain save the dreamy music then the bard struck another key and a gentle sorrow possessed the hearts of his hearers and unbidden tears gathered to their eyes then with bolder hand he swept his fingers across his lyre and all hearts were moved to joy and pleasant laughter and eyes that had been dimmed by tears sparkled as brightly as running waters dancing in the sun when the last notes had died away a cheer arose loud as the voice of the storm in the glen when the live thunder is reveling on the mountain tops as soon as the bard had descended the mound the scald from the northern lands took his place greeted by cries of welcome from a hundred thousand throats he touched his harp and in the perfect silence was heard the strain of the mermaid's song and through it the pleasant ripple of summer waters on the pebbly beach then the theme changed and on the air was borne the measured sweep of countless oars and the swish of waters around the prows of contending galleys and the breezy voices of the sailors and the sea-birds cry then his theme was changed to the mirth and laughter of the banquet hall the clang of meeting drinking horns and songs of battle when the last strain ended from the mighty host a great shout went up loud as the roar of winter billows breaking in the hollows of the shore and men knew not whom to declare the victor the chief bard of erin or the scald of the northern lands in the height of the debate the cry arose that another competitor had ascended the mound and there standing in view of all was fergus the huntsman's son all eyes were fastened upon him but no one looked so eagerly as the princess he touched his harp with gentle fingers and a sound low and soft as a faint summer breeze passing through the forest trees stole out and then was heard the rustle of birds through the branches and the dreamy murmur of waters lost in deepest woods and all the fairy echoes whispering when the leaves are motionless in the noonday heat then followed notes cool and soft as the drip of summer showers on the parched grass and then the song of the blackbird sounding as clearly as it sounds in long silent spaces of the evening and then in one sweet jocund burst the multitudinous voices that hailed the breaking of the morn and the lark singing and soaring above the minstrel sank mute and motionless upon his shoulder and from all the leafy woods the birds came thronging out and formed a fluttering canopy above his head when the bard ceased playing no shout arose from the mighty multitude for the strains of his harp long after its chords were stilled held their hearts spellbound and when he had passed away from the mound of contest all knew that there was no need to declare the victor and all were glad the comely fenian champion had maintained the supremacy of the bards of erin but there was one heart sad the heart of the princess and now she wished more than ever that she had never made her hateful vow other contests went on but fergus took no interest in them and once more he stole away to the forest glade his heart was sorrowful for he thought of the great race of the morning and he knew that he could not hope to compete with the rider of the white steed of the plains and as he lay beneath the spreading branches during the whole night long his thoughts were not of the victory he had won but of the princess who was as far away from him as ever 
he passed the night without sleep, and when the morning came he rose and walked aimlessly through the woods. A deer, starting from a thicket, reminded him of the happy days of his boyhood, and once more the wish came back to him that he had never left his forest home. As his eyes followed the deer wistfully, suddenly he started in amazement. The deer vanished from view, and in his stead was the wild horse of the mountains. "'I told you I'd do you a good turn,' said the Puka, "'for the kindness you and yours did me on that wild winter's night. "'The day is passing. You have no time to lose. "'The white steed of the plains is coming to the starting post. "'Jump on my back, and remember, faint heart never won, fair lady.' "'In half a second Fergus was bestride the Puka, "'whose coat of shaggy hair became at once as glossy as silk, "'and just at the very moment when the king was about to declare "'that there was no steed to compete with the white steed of the plains,' The Puka, with Fergus upon his back, galloped up in front of the royal enclosure. When the people saw the champion, a thunderous shout rose up that startled the birds in the skies and sent them flying to the groves. And in the ladies' enclosure was a rustle of many-colored scarves waving in the air. At the striking of the shields, the contending steeds rushed from the post with the swiftness of a swallow's flight. But before the white steed of the plains had gone halfway round, Fergus and the wild horse of the mountains had passed the winning post, greeted by such cheers as had never before been heard on the plains of Tara. Fergus heard the cheers, but scarcely heeded them, for his heart went out through his eyes that were fastened on the princess, and a wild hope stirred him that his glance was not ungrateful to the loveliest lady in the land. And the princess was sad and sorry for her vow, for she believed that it was beyond the power of Fergus to bring her a robe of all the colors of the rainbow, so subtly woven as to fit in the palm of her soft white hand. That night also Fergus went to the forest, not too sad, because there was a vague hope in his heart that had never been there before. He lay down under the branches, with his feet towards the rustling waters, and the smiles of the princess gilded his slumbers as the rays of the rising sun gild the glades of the forest, and when the morning came he was scarcely surprised when before him appeared the little old woman with a shuttle he had welcomed on the winter's night. "'You think you have won her already,' said the little woman, "'and so you have too. Her heart is all your own, and I'm half inclined to think that my trouble will be thrown away. For if you had never a wedding robe to give her, she'd rather have you this minute than all the kings of Erin, or, or than all the other princes and kings and chieftains in the whole world.' But you and your father and mother were kind to me on a wild winter's night, and I'd never see your mother's son without a wedding robe fit for the greatest princess that ever set nations to battle for her beauty. So go and pluck me a handful of wild forest flowers, and I'll weave out of them a wedding robe with all the colors of the rainbow, and one that will be as sweet and fragrant as the ripe red lips of the princess herself. Fergus, with joyous heart, culled the flowers and brought them to the little old woman. In the twinkling of an eye she wove with her little shuttle a wedding robe, with all the colors of the rainbow, as light as the fairy dew, as soft as the hand of the princess, as fragrant as her little red mouth, and so small that it would pass through the eye of a needle. "'Go now, Fergus,' said she, "'and may luck go with you. But in the days of your greatness, and of the glory which will come to you when you are wedded to the princess, be as kind, and have as open a heart and as open a door for the poor as you, when you were only a poor huntsman's son.' Fergus took the robe and went towards Tara. It was the last day of the fair, and all the contests were over, and the bards were about to chant the farewell strange to the memory of the great queen. But before the chief bard could ascend the mound, Fergus, attended by a troop of Fenian warriors on their steeds, galloped into the enclosure, and rode up in front of the queen's pavilion. Holding up the glancing and many-coloured robe, he said, O queen and king of Erin, I claim the princess for my bride. You, O king, have decided that I have won the prize in the contest of the bards, that I have won the prize in the race against the white steed of the plains. It is for the princess to say if the robe which I give her will fit in the hollow of her small white hand. Yes, said the king, you are victor in the contests. Let the princess declare if you have fulfilled the last condition. The princess took the robe from Fergus, closed her fingers over it so that no vestige of it was to be seen. Yes, O king, said she, he has fulfilled the last condition, but before ever he has fulfilled a single one of them, my heart went out to the comely champion of the Fenny. I was willing then, I am ready now, to become the bride of the huntsman's son. End of section 4 Recording by Joseph Jones